When somebody is by themselves in their house, they are this close to throwing in the towel. And not only that, but we as believers, we are being attacked by the devil. Jesus was talking to his disciples that day in, in the upper room, and he was looking at them, love one another, love one another. Because when you leave this room, there's an enemy out there who's trying to take you under. There's an enemy out there who's trying to end you, who's trying to take your faith and just cast it to the wind and put it through the shredder. But if you will encourage one another, if you will have empathy with one another, if you will show hospitality and give to someone who needs, if you will give somebody what they need when they need it, that says, I love you. But we are in this world where we're just so vulnerable to attack and the devil hates God. And because he hates God, he hates God's children. And because he hates God's children, he's attacking us. He's attacking our homes. He's attacking our marriages. He's just trying to just throw us to the wind. But we can band together. We can love one another. We can grab one another. We can show affection to one another. We can encourage one another. And that is the thing that will make our world say, that's a real God. If they love one another. And by the way, not just love the way our world does. A supernatural love. A Holy Ghost love. A love that forgives when somebody doesn't deserve it. When somebody does something to me, I'm like, okay, it hurt. But God forgave me, so I forgive you. And this is true love being walked out. We must be loving one another in this way. chapter 13 will be our jump off John 13 today we are going to be focusing on the month that we're focusing on love month today we're focusing on uh, a specific place that God would have us to be loving so John chapter 13 let's all let's all uh, be there in the same place and here's what the Bible says little children Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have commanded you, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Let's pray together. Father, today, we thank you and we praise you for your love. Lord, you, you have loved us with an everlasting love. You've loved us perfectly. You have loved us purely. We would never be able to match your love. But Lord, we want to be able to mimic you and emulate you in a specific way as we love one another. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us to be able to feel your love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, to feel it so strongly that it flows like a river into us and then through us and then flows to the people that we touch, flows to the people that we know. Lord, I pray that love today would not just be a, a concept, that it would not just be a feeling and an emotion. I pray that it would be an act, an action, that it would be a lifestyle that we live to one another. And I pray, Father, that you would help me as I speak, that you would give me, please, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Give me your filling. I pray that you would help me to say what I should say and keep me back from saying what I should not say. And I pray that our time together today would be profitable for eternity and that you would speak to each one of our hearts individually in a very powerful way. Help me as I speak this morning. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room. The upper room was that place that uh, later that the day of Pentecost came, they were all in that upper room. It's that place 
where they were sort of in an enclave together. And Jesus told them something that they didn't really fully grasp. They didn't fully get it until it was, it was go time. It was in dim, flickering light as they sat around at night. They were just now finished the Passover meal. He had passed uh, the cup to each one of them, and, and they had drunk, and he had broken the bread and told them, this is my body, this is my blood, that I'm going to, I'm going to die. I'm going to die for you. It's shed for you. My body is broken for you. And now the disciples are wide-eyed, and they're looking at Jesus, and it's dim. All they can see is the flickering Candles, But now I believe Jesus's eyes burning with the fire of urgency that I have something to tell you because everything is about to change. Your whole life, your whole world is about to change because I'm going to leave. I'm not just going to die and be buried and rise again. I'm going to leave, leave. Uh, and he's going to ascend. Jesus would be gone. If there's somebody that, that you know that had been a security blanket to you and you, that's all you had known and then they're taken away from you or they leave and they're gone, everything seems to change. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and I don't know what their attitude was the whole night, but I know that from this moment on, everything was exceedingly somber. Everything was solemn. And he says, I'm going to leave. And he said, I'm going to give you a new commandment. This new commandment is going to be the most important thing I tell you, not just tonight. It's going to be the most important thing that I've told you in my ministry. It's going to be the most important thing for you to remember for the rest of your ministry, for the rest of your lives. And he says this, a new commandment I give unto you. They had had a lot of commandments. In the Old Testament, there's 430 commandments. We know about the Ten Commandments, and I can list off a couple, and I can think of two or three, but 430, how hard is that to keep 430 commandments? And Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law. I came to do away with the law. I came to show the true spirit of the law. And so in Jesus and in his death, the old law is done away. But he said, I am going to give you a new law, one commandment. And in this commandment is fulfilled all of the law and the prophets. If you keep this commandment, you will automatically be keeping the Old, the old Testament law. You will automatically be keeping the spirit of the Ten Commandments. And this is the one commandment. This a new commandment I give unto you that you, let's say that word together, one, two, three, that you love one another. Say those three words, that you love one another. So in some ways, we could say that God is telling us as the church today, as Freedom Life Baptist Church, you have one job. You've got one job that I want you to be doing. If you do this, you'll be doing a lot of things all at once. But there's one commandment that's the most important commandment, and that is that you love one another. Another. In the Old Testament, it was the very first commandment that God gave. He said that, uh, hear, o Lord, hear, o Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind, and all thy strength. And the second commandment was like unto it, Jesus said, that you love one another, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. God wants us to love one another. Ask yourself this question. How good... Are you at loving one another? How good am I at loving one another? How good am I at loving my neighbor? How good am I at loving my family? How good am I at loving my church? How good am I at loving the people in my church? How good am I at loving the cool people in my church and the uncool people in my church? How good am I at loving the happy people in my church and the somber people at my church? How good am I at loving the outgoing, gregarious people at my church and the more shy, withdrawn people in my church? How good are we? And since it's the one job that God's given to us, I believe that we should give ourselves and practice makes perfect uh, actually, perfect practice makes perfect if you shoot something the wrong way, uh, if you practice it the wrong way. So God wants us to practice this, to be about this, to love one another. How many have ever seen one of these 
Russian dolls. Ever seen those before, these Russian dolls? And uh, my dad one time, he went to um, that part of the world and brought it back and he opened it up and ah, I thought there was gonna be candy inside. There's another doll that looks just like it over here, okay. And so you open that one, and there's another one that looks just like it on the end. And so you're like, mm, okay, I got it, I start, I get it. Maybe eventually there'll be candy. In, and no, they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, but they all look the same. They're all made of the same material. When they had some extra wood left over, they just made another one. They still had some more left over, they made up. And so they put them in there and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I've heard this as a picture of maybe what the Trinity is like, that God the Father and then the Son and the Holy Spirit, they're all made of the same substance, they all look the same. I don't know if that works well because one of them's smaller than the other one and they're all equal. But in this, I want everybody to see this concept as the big one is, that's one doll. And you give it to somebody like, oh, this is the present that you've given me. Thank you. And you open it up and there's another present on the inside that looks almost the same, a little bit smaller. And you open it up and it's the gift that keeps on giving. And there's just more and more and more and they just get smaller, but it's all the same. But it's one gift. That's the Russian doll. The word Russian doll means 25,000 dolls inside of one doll. And there's, sometimes there's 10, sometimes there's five, but they're all one gift and they're all the same thing. God wants us to love one another. It's the one commandment, just one commandment God wants us to be keeping and fulfilling and striving to do. But when you open it up, love exists inside of itself in different forms and in different ways. There's one commandment, love one another, but that looks different. And we love one another in different ways. There's this concept called love languages. Anybody ever heard of that? There's different love languages. There's different ways to love someone, but it's all still love. It looks like love, but it looks a little bit different than the other form of love. And so what does it mean to love one another? So we're going to open up the doll today. And there's another one and another one and another one. I have 10 points uh, and we're going we're gonna to zoom through them. But I believe, and there's probably more ways that we can love. These all come from the scriptures. It's what God wants his body to be doing for itself. But it all says, I love you. It all means I love you. So let's, let's jump in. Ten ways to love one another. There are ten ways to love, and we'll just say ten, uh, and then we'll be done. Number one, pray for one another. Pray for one another. When is the last time you prayed for someone else in the body of Christ? I love our church. I appreciate our church. I believe our church is a praying church. We have some, some deep prayer requests that have come even this last week and the last couple weeks. Serious things that our church has really rallied around and prayed. And I love that about our church. How often do you pray for the people in your family? How often do you pray for the people in our church? James 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much that ye may be healed. There are some healings that take place because we pray for one another, as the Bible says. And I believe that there may be some healings that don't take place. Because we are not praying for one another. I believe in a marriage, if we pray for one another, there can be healing in a marriage. If we pray for one another, in our churches, in our families, if we are praying for one another physically, praying for one another emotionally, praying, bringing somebody before the throne of God and saying, God, I love you and I love this person. Would you take your love and shower it on this person to pray for somebody else? Because prayer works. That's what the Bible says. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It means you pull a lever and something happens. Something takes place when you pray. Don't ever think 
That if I spend time praying for somebody, that that doesn't, I, well, I didn't see anything happen. Maybe nothing happened. Something always happens when you pray. Prayer changes things. Sometimes prayer changes you. You're kind of at odds with somebody, but you prayed for them, and now God changed your heart towards them and made you a more loving person towards them. Prayer has now changed your relationship with that person because it changed you. Oftentimes you do this, Lord, I'm going to pray for this person. Change them. <laughs> Oftentimes it's us that needs to change and, and we, we, we say, okay, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to pray for you. But as the song says, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. When we pray, God can change us. And so we need to be praying for one another. It says in 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, this is Samuel talking about Saul and the nation of Israel. This is right when God rejected Saul as king. And he said, Saul, you're not going to be king anymore. I'm going to find somebody else to be the king. We know that to be David. And so Samuel said this, he said, moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Samuel said, I've got a responsibility to the people of Israel. I've got a responsibility to Saul to keep praying for him. Sometimes if you are in a relationship with someone and you're like, oh, I'm mad at you, so I'm going to stop praying for you. Samuel said that would be a sin against God not to talk to him about his children, not to love his children in a way that is probably the most important way that we can love one another is to pray for one another. Jesus was talking to Peter and Peter said, Jesus, I will go everywhere with you. I will die for you. And Jesus said, well, actually, Peter, um, I've looked into the future and tonight before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Because that's going to be, you know, it's going to be a hard trial. I'm going to get arrested and they're going to they're going to want to take you to it. And so Peter kind of shifted out of the way. And then Jesus said this: Satan has asked for you specifically by name. That he may sift you as wheat. He wants to take your life and shuffle your life around and totally destroy your faith. But I have prayed for you, Jesus said. Jesus said, I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith would fail not. You know that sometimes our faith is literally up on the chopping block and somebody else can pray for us that our faith fails not. There are a lot of churches that do a lot of things in our world today. And the way that the church operates sometimes is in a way that the world sees Sometimes hypocrisy, that the world sees pride or the world sees judgmentalism and the world says, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Ask yourself this question. What does churches look like to our world when they drive by and they see a church building? Do they see a place where if I go in there, I'll be judged. If I go in there, I'll be compared. If I go in there, I'll be put down. If I go in there, people might stray away from me. Or do they see a church the way God wants the church to be known? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. By the love that we have for one another. Our faith in this world is on display either in positive or negative terms based on how we love one another. Do people know when they come into a church, I'm going to be loved in that place. I'm going to be prayed for in that place. If I miss, they'll miss me. If I come, they'll love me. They will embrace me. Are we loving each other in a supernatural way that our world says, I'm so thirsty. I need what they have down there at the church because I know the love of God is going to be ready for me, welcoming me, poured all over me when I arrive at a church. We need to be mimicking that. We need to be exemplary of that because that's the way that the world will know that we are God's disciples by the love that we have for another and as we pray for one another. How do we love one another? Number two, in our connection. In our connection. How connected are we? Romans 12 verse 15 says this, Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. When's the last time you found somebody who was rejoicing and rejoiced with them? We oftentimes can be jealous. We can be Jay. We can say, oh, you got, the, oh, man, they got blessed and I never get blessed. That person gets, oh, Lord. And so now because we're comparing to somebody else, we see them rejoicing and we don't rejoice with somebody that God gave a blessing to them and we're not rejoicing with them. Or somebody weeps and we don't weep with them. 
So the word connection I want to define as to stay close in communication and curiosity and empathy. To see someone and to feel with them. Empathy is a word that I think is becoming uh, much more well understood today. The word sympathy is different than empathy. Sympathy means I feel sorry for you. Sympathy means I feel bad for you. Somebody, something happens to somebody and say, oh, I'm way over here and I see something bad has happened to them and I feel sorry for them, but I, I feel it from over here. I feel sorry for them. The word empathy means I feel with them. It means I can picture myself what it would be like to be in their shoes and I feel what they feel. God wants his body to be experiencing empathy for one another. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there should be no schism or division in the body, that we're not fractured, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. When one person goes through something, I go through that too. Alex, if you could come up here and help me. Alex and I are friends, but we're about to get in a fight. Because Alex is, you know, it's kind of, he, every now and then he does some weird stuff. And so after a while, I'm like, you know what, Alex? I'm going to pick a fight with Alex. So we're literally going to put on the boxing gloves, bing, bing, and get into a boxing ring. And me and Alex are going to go after it. And here's what happens. I punched Alex. Oh, <coughs> what happened there? So now I'm going to kick him. All right, I'm going to come right here. And I'm gonna, oh, man, what is, what is going on here? Did you realize that there's actually an ESP connected between me and Alex? Every time I punch him, I feel it. I feel it where I punched him. If I karate chop him on the shoulder, ah, I feel it because, and this is literally what we do as the body of Christ. We hurt one another. We lash out at one another. We speak ill of one another. We cut and harm. And God says, be careful if you, if you bite and devour one another. But here's what happens. When I do that, I'm actually hurting myself because Alex and I are a part of the same family. We are a part of the same body. And if I hurt him, I'm inflicting pain on myself. Whenever Alex goes through something, so I'm a twin, I have a twin brother. People used to always ask me growing up, hey pastor, or hey, hey David, when your brother Daniel, when I kick him, do you feel it? And I'm like, okay, what was that all about? Apparently there's this ESP that some people say inside of twins. And so if there is, uh, and now we're across the country from one another, and it's like, hey, do you, do you feel anything? Like, is he, what's, he, what's he going through? Do I tap in? But literally, in the body of Christ, God says, when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. We are connected to one another. And it's when we get away from remembering that. It's when we get away from uh, observing that and practicing that. If somebody in our body goes through something, I need to look at it as I'm going through that. If they need help, I need help. If they need help, I can be the hands and the feet of God to be connected with them. When's the last time that you talked to someone and as they were talking, you asked them questions and were connected with curiosity and everything that they said, you're like, oh, I can see what that must be like. And even if I can't, I have not experienced it. I try to use my imagination to picture what it would be like to be in their shoes. Thank you, Alex. God bless you. Oh, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, give Alex a big hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. That we are connected is a spiritual reality that if we forget it, we will start stepping over each other. We will start ignoring one another. And we'll do it to our own peril. We will do it to our own hurt. We need to remember that I am connected to everybody in the body of Christ. I'm connected to everybody in this body of Christ. When one person goes through despair, when one person goes through depression, I ought to be able to feel that 
for them, to feel that with them, to be connected and to be communicating. If we're not talking to one another, we will never get that from one another. If we're not connected in communication, if we're not curious, hey, what's happening in your life? Tell me what I can pray for. And if they're going through something, I ought to be able to back up and say, man, that must be really hard. What can I do to help? Because we are all connected. If one member suffer, we all suffer. Number two, connection. Number three, harmony. Harmony looks like love. The word harmony, to find something that you have in common with someone and then defend your unity. To sit down with somebody and say, hey, tell me about this. Tell me about that. And find common ground. We live in a world where everybody is disconnected from everybody else. We live in a world where things are dichotomized, where things are separated, where if you're not from this part of the country, you're not, you're an outsider. Where if you don't follow this same football team that I do, we're not connected. Where if you're from this Democrat or Republican party, if you're from this nation or not from this nation, that we find ways to divide. We've got to stop doing this. We need to find the commonalities that we share because after all of the presidential parties are destroyed, after all of the teams are gone, after all of the nations are gone, we as God's people will live together in heaven for all of eternity. And that's all the people in South America, and that's all the people in Russia, and that's all the people in Africa, and that's all the people in Asia, and that's all the people in America who know Christ as Savior. We're connected forever. We need to act like that now so that the world can know that God sent Jesus. But even in our body, you talk to somebody and say, I don't know what we have in common. You have something in common with everyone. You have something in common with everyone in this room. You have something in common with everyone in the world who knows Jesus. You have that in common. All of us were on our way to hell to be to just be lost and separated from God for all of eternity. And all of us, God loved us enough to come down for us and die on the cross and stay up on the cross. And it was his love for us. It was not the nails that held him up there. It was his love for us that made him drink our sin to the dregs and take our punishment and take our, all of our sorrow and take all of our guilt on him. We have that in common. We've got to stop looking for things that divide us and start looking for the things that unite us and then defend that unity. The Holy Spirit has a few jobs in, this, in the church, and one of them is the unity of the Spirit. He creates that unity. But then it is our job to maintain that unity, to defend that unity, to uphold that unity. Don't ever let something come and divide you from another brother in Christ. We have, we have things in common that are eternal. Anything that separates us is temporary. Anything that will separate you from your brother in Christ will be gone before you know it. But the things that unify us last for all of eternity. So we need to have harmony. Philippians 2 verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies. By the way, we didn't mention this verse in the last point, but to, to feel empathy for somebody, literally that word, if any bowels and mercies, it's talking about the heart strings. And when you, when you see something happen uh, to somebody else that you actually feel it with them, that's bowels. Like literally people's bowels were moved for someone else. It's talking about your heart being pulled. I don't know if you've ever felt that where you started to cry, you feel somebody, and it's like, it feels like your heart is literally being pulled on. That's that word, bowels. If you have that in the body of Christ, we need to have that for each other. Then it says, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. This is an amazingly specific thing that God is asking the church to be and to do. To be of one accord, to be of one mind, to think thoughts for one another, to be unified in how we think. Ephesians 4 verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The word endeavor means to try really, really hard, to strive and push to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. God wants us to be in harmony because harmony looks like love. Number four, all through the Bible, it's all through the New Testament. 
It says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. That word in honor preferring one another literally means this, to outdo one another in showing honor. To, to one up the other person in showing honor. And this is funny sometimes where we're like, hey, you, I'm going to open the door for you. You go. And then the person's like, no, you go. And so they go, and then there's another door. And okay, no. And so we're like trying to outdo the other person. They do something nice for me. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to do something nicer for them. And we're always trying to outdo one another. That's hospitality. That is literally what God says in honor, preferring one another. Put other people ahead of you. Think of other people as above you and act in that way. Hospitality. Romans 12 verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. The word hospitality. We get two words from it. One is house. Get the word house. You use your house for hospitality. And two, we get hospital from hospitality. What do you do in a hospital? You have a place where you can bring people in and help them. That's what a hospital is. Whatever they need help with physically, if they have an injury, there's a house that you can bring them in and help them. And God wants us as God's body to be doing this. It says a pastor, is that a pastor needs to be given to hospitality. I need to know what this is and be doing it. But God didn't say it just for pastors. He says that he wants his body to be distributing to the necessity of saints and given to hospitality. Hospitality means to give or to entertain or to shelter. Back in those days, if, if somebody was in, the, in the, the nation of Israel, if somebody was traveling through and they came to your house and they knocked on your door, and you open up and say, hey, do you have any place where uh, I could stay the night because I'm just traveling through? God wanted Israel to say, okay. I, now, in America today, we're like, okay. Uh, I saw you on my ring doorbell when you were coming up here and you're kind of shady, so uh, have a good day. We don't usually, because there's a lot of crime that happens today with love strangers, but in the Old Testament, God wanted them to be housing strangers, people that they didn't even know. And not only that, when they would come into your house, you would defend them. So if he's like, hey, they're chasing me. Can I stay in here? You're like, okay, you come in. And then when those people that are chasing them get there, you're like, hey, you need to go somewhere else because... He's protected in this house. That's literally what they were doing, what God wanted them to be doing, to be protecting one another with our hospitality. Look what it says in 1 John 3. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion. There it is again, the bowels. Shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? God says if you see a brother that has a need, and you have the ability to meet that need, the way that we love them in that moment, in that way, is to give them whatever they need. God wants us to be showing hospitality, because hospitality says, I love you. Number five. Forgive. Our church is young and we don't know each other deep, deep, deeply. And really there's nothing that has happened in our church where somebody has offended somebody else. But go long enough and somebody will offend you. Somebody will do something. You're like, hey, I don't like the fact that you did that. In any place where there's humans, fallen humans, eventually somebody's going to do something. You know what God says? I got a solution for that. Forgive one another. Whatever they did, it's not as bad as what we all did to Jesus by nailing him on the cross. And while they were doing that, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus forgave us when we were running away from him. He said, and this God commended his love toward us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And through the basis of his death, he has the authority to forgive us of our sins. So then God says this. 1 Peter 4, verse 8, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity, that's love, shall cover the multitude of sins. We'll get back to that moment in a moment. Colossians 3, verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You know what forbearing is? It literally is this great picture of the mother tiger who's got a baby cub. That comes and is pulling on her ear and chomping and pulling on her. And the mother tiger, you've ever seen this? That tiger can rip a man to shreds, but will let that little baby 
crawl all over it and bite it and, and you're like, wow, there's something going on inside that tiger. You know what it is? It's forbearing. It's forgiving its little child. We do this instinctively in some relationships, but we need to become better at doing it in all of our relationships because that's what Jesus did for us to forbear one another to forgive one another if any has a quarrel against any even as Christ forgave you so also do ye God says here's why I'm asking so here's how I know you can do it because I did it for you and you can do it and here's why it has strength because we have already been forgiven by God and God says, I want you to pass that to the next person because that says, I love you. Love one another. Ephesians 4 verse 32. A lot of people, this is a very familiar verse. As a child, we memorized this. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. This is what we should be doing for one another. Number six, community. I love you. Love one another in the body of Christ looks like community. What is community? It means to hang out together. It means to gather together. It means to play together. Uh, I love hanging out with God's people. We have so much in common. Uh, if we were to, if everything were to disappear right now, we'd all be in heaven for all of eternity. And all the jobs and all the stress and all the bills, all that will be gone. But we know what eternity looks like for all of us. We can pause and just breathe and just hang out and have a good time. We can do that at any moment. We, we live too much in our rat race. We live too much with our goals. We live too much with our anxieties and our bills. We live too much with that burdening us down. But the Bible says that the life of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We can hang out with each other. When is the last time? You got together with some people and just hung out and it felt like the day flew by. You're like, man, I, where did the time go? I just loved hanging out with them so much. God wants us to develop into being that with each other. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 11 verse 19. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Jesus went to people's gatherings. He went and he hung out with people. Matter of fact, Jesus went to parties and he sat with the publicans and the tax collectors and the sinners. He sat with the prostitutes and the harlots. He sat with the people that nobody else wanted to sit with and he hung out with them. People were drawn to Jesus because he was built like that on purpose. And you know what he says? Wisdom is justified of her children. I came to reach people and you can't reach people without being with them and hanging out with them. I want to encourage all of us to be hanging out with each other. And I know that some sometimes clicks and little uh, exclusive friendships happen. We don't want that, but hang out with each other. Go over to each other's houses, be around each other, call each other, text one another, hang out because this is community. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, and they continuing daily, daily. Oh, if I saw this person every day, I get sick of them. Uh, they continuing daily. Look what they were doing. With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They had community and they were hanging out from house to house. And next thing you know, hey. There's somebody new in here. Oh, well, new people. I like our church as it is. I like our group as it is. No, every day new people were coming. And another person, and they were being added daily to the church. They were getting saved. And like, and can you imagine, again, what the first day of kindergarten was like? Well, you walked in and, oh, no. It's my hair. Uh, do I have on the right thing? Will they accept me? That feeling, that's the feeling when anybody comes into a church, brand new church, they don't know if people are going to look at them and laugh or like them or accept them. But we need to know that God accepts everybody that comes to him. All that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Everybody fits. Everybody belongs. 
And this is what they were doing. They were hanging out from house to house daily and they were eating their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And people came in and they saw this party, this, this love in the Holy Ghost party. They were living life together and loving each other. And they said, I want to be a part of this. And they said, okay. And they included them. And every day, more and more people were being added because they had community. We need community because community says, I love you. Love one another. Number seven, humility. This is a big one. Living for others before you live for yourself. I heard a good definition of humility. Humility is not thinking little of yourself. It's not thinking of yourself as being low. It's thinking of others higher than you. It's, thinking, it's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. It's not being focused on yourself. It's not walking around and saying, Whoosh. Which I am such a bad person. That's not humility. That's weird. But it's to put other people, to live for others, to think of others. It's like, I got some extra money. I'm going to spend it on. No, I'm not going to spend it on me first. I'm going to think of what can I do to bless somebody else. That is humility. Colossians 3 verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. There that is again. Put on the empathy, thinking of other people, feeling with them. But then it says kindness. Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. God wants us to have a humility and to put that on. You know what that means? It doesn't come automatic. Uh, we came into this world naked. You have to put on clothes. And God knows that we're selfish by nature, but we put on humility. We decide to put it on. It means I don't automatically think that way, but I need to train myself to think that way, to think about others before I think about myself. Number eight. Affection. What does affection look like to you? When you come to a church, is that a place of affection? Ah, that's, that's weird to come and somebody gives you a hug. Look what they were doing in the, Old Testament, in the New Testament. Watch this. Romans 12 verse 10. Be kindly affectioned. So affection in the body of Christ. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Which means to outdo one another in showing honor. God wants affection to be a part of his body. Did you know that I heard this step recently that a human being needs about eight hugs a day to feel okay. People who never get hugged, they're like, there's something, there's a physiological reality where you feel like you're drifting away that nobody really loves me, nobody cares. Church ought to be a place where there's affection. Where somebody comes alongside of you and they, they give you a hug. Where they shake your hand and they look you in the eye and there's affection. Literally, this is what they were doing. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 26. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Well, Pastor David, we live in America and they don't, we don't kiss people the way they did in the Greek times and the Roman times. So what do we do then? Well, I mean, nothing because that's weird. Well, you know, COVID, you know, we don't want to spread COVID. God said, greet one another with a holy kiss. Have you ever seen the Middle Eastern culture when they would get together? They would, you know, they would grab each other by the arm, yeah, hey, brother, and they would kiss. And, you know, I've been around Greek people and Italian people literally today. They still kiss each other one cheek and the other cheek and the, because there's an affection. Well, that's that part of the cut. That's, you know, the world is different today and over here. No, there are people that go to a church. And nobody ever looks them in the eye. Nobody ever shakes their hand. Nobody ever tells them, I'm glad you're here. Nobody ever embraces them. And the church for them is a place of weirdness, is a place of awkwardness, is a place of standoffishness, and even a place of rejection because God wants us to be showing each other affection. He literally says that it to be a brotherly love to be kindly affectioned to one another. Because affection says, I love you. Love one another. Number nine, honor. Honor. To honor one another. And this, we define this as a servant-hearted act. To do something to honor someone. To do something to show them I was thinking about you. To do something to show them you're important to me. I, I rank you up here. And all of all the people in the world, and I love this, somebody said, when you talk to somebody, pretend that they're the only person that exists in the whole universe 
right then and there. When's the last time that you were talking to someone and you felt like they, they were listening to you, they were looking at you, it felt like everything else fell away and you were the only person that, that existed in the world to that person. They made you feel that special. You want to be around people like that. You're, 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 the next time you come, you're like, hey, where's that person? Because the last time I talked to them, and then they do it again, you're like, wow, I love that. Are we honoring one another? Are we doing servant-hearted acts? Philippians 2 verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Where'd I put my phone? Here's my phone. You know what a phone is? A phone is how you can show somebody that they are or they are not important. Here's what I mean. Hey, what's going on? Wait a second. Oh, so what were you saying? <laughs> One second again. And how often do we go out to eat with somebody and put the phone on the table right there? And we're checking our Facebook or we're checking our Instagram. <laughs> Excuse me one second. <laughs> we're telling them, you're not as important as this. You're not as important as my little world. I want to encourage you, when you're with some people, put your phone away. There's some parties, and I've heard these the celebrities throw a party, and they have a bowl. And when you go into that party, you put your phone in the bowl, and you don't touch it for the rest of the party. You know why? Because that person was like, we're here. Be present with us. Talk to us. There's some people that go to parties, and they just sit in the corner. and just, You know what they're saying? This is what's important, and none of y'all are important. I want to I want to challenge all of you to think: How do you use your phone to show people they are important or they're not important? And I want to encourage you: Sometimes just put it away, just turn it off, just put it in your pocket. When you're out to dinner, don't put it on the table. And oh, <laughs> excuse me, I know that you're important, but this is more important. So, God says we want to show honor to one another. Romans 12, verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. That means we're doing acts for people to show them that we want to outdo them in showing honor. Some of these verses are overlapping, but I love how God has meshed them all together because he wants us to be practicing all of this daily. Number 10, and we're done. Encourage one another. How do you tell somebody I love you in the body of Christ? This is ranks way up there. To encourage somebody. What does it mean to encourage somebody? First Thessalonians 5 verse 11. Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify or encourage one another even as also you do. The word edify means to take building blocks and to build someone up. We are good at tearing somebody down. There, when I was growing up, it was, there was your mama jokes and there was ugly jokes and there was you're so dumb jokes. And, and we, oh, that's a funny one. And I would try to remember all the jokes and we go on the bus to basketball games and you're telling mama jokes and you're telling ugly jokes and you're telling all these jokes, these put downs. This is human nature. We are, we are, we gravitate towards the nasty things, the things that are, are disgusting to God, to tear each other down. If you go and you watch some of these shows where the comedians are, they do like a battle and rap battles and they're like trying to tear each other down, that is not God. God wants us to be building one another up. When is the last time you saw somebody as a little pile of rubble and you said, I'm going to go and I'm going to build their city for them. I'm going to go and I'm going to build them up. I want to build up their self-esteem. I want to build them up with my words. This is what God wants us to be doing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. God wants us to be doing this for one another, healing one another, building each other up, encouraging one another. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What's corrupt communication? I know what that is. It's curse words. It's more than that. Corrupt communication is anything that tears somebody down. Anything, when I was a boy, this literally happened. We were sitting at the table, and my little brother Adrian said something, and he said, uh, today I blah, blah, blah. And I don't even remember what he said, but I remember what I said. I was like, big deal. I heard somebody say that. I thought it was pretty cool. Big deal. And my dad said, hey, don't you ever say big deal to somebody. And I was like, yes, sir. 
Because you know what he was saying? You can take your words and tell anybody that their world, what's important to them, is not important. You know what you're doing? You're kicking over their blocks. You're destroying their Legos. You're destroying what they're building. And it doesn't have to be curse words. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's anything that you do to make somebody feel small. Literally, in the NBA, they're doing this. You score on somebody, you're like, you do this. We need to stop doing that. We need to stop thinking that way. What about, hey, hey, what's going on, man? You are this to me. You are big to me. I want to encourage you. We don't encourage people like we should. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Look at that word grace. God says give people grace with your words. You know what grace means? Giving somebody what they don't deserve. Giving somebody something good that they don't deserve. Don't wait until somebody wins before you tell them good job. Don't wait until somebody is excellent before you tell them they're excellent. Tell them when they don't deserve it. Tell people that don't deserve your love that you love them. Tell people that don't deserve necessarily to be encouraged that you are proud of them. Because people who need encouragement are probably some people that we think they don't deserve it. God says don't look at whether or not they deserve it. Give grace to the hearers. Give people what they do not deserve. Here's some four ways to encourage someone. Four ways. It's D-A-Q-A. I remember I, I memorized this years ago. There's four areas that you can encourage anybody. Number one, D, something they have done for you. If somebody has done something for you, next time you see them, say, hey, I want to tell you, thank you for doing that. I saw that you did that. I appreciate that. And that'll make them feel big. That'll make them feel like a million bucks. Thank you for doing that for me. That shows appreciation. We ought to be thankful anyway. But when you tell them, you're encouraging them. Number two, Something that they have accomplished. The Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice. If somebody has accomplished something, come alongside of them and say, hey, good job. Good job. I'm proud of you. You did a good job. If they have they got a trophy for something, you make something big out of their accomplishment and you will encourage them. There's a lot of people <laughs> that they, they, on their job, they get some um, promotion or something and they come home and they feel like, oh, man. Hey, I got a promotion. Well, you didn't care? Okay. Uh, not that we do that in our families, but we need to really encourage people when they accomplish something, show them that you appreciate that. Number three, a character quality that they possess. If somebody is a nice person, see that about them. Hey, you're a really nice person. I, I see that about you. If somebody is uh, an outgoing person, Take time to say, hey, I see you're a people person and encourage them about a character quality. Then number four is appearance. That's the easy, that's like the, that's like the, the, the softball. If somebody has nice shoes, you tell them they have nice shoes. But that can be superficial, but at least it's encouraging. But we need to be able to see people and to encourage them with what they're doing. To encourage them with what they're being in their life. And it builds them up. When is the last time? You took time to encourage someone. And I can, tell you, I can tell you this about myself, about all of us. If you will encourage people, they will, hey, that person encouraged me. I like that person. I, they'll like being around you. There's some people like, I don't have any friends. If you will encourage people, everywhere you go, just encourage people. And I heard this, it's the 30-second rule. Within the first 30 seconds of talking to somebody, you notice something and you encourage them. Hey, I just want to take, yeah. Nice shoes. I, those are really cool shoes. It, and don't be like, if I could rob them, of, you know, <laughs> don't be like that. But tell somebody in the first 30 seconds, hey, yeah, I remember you did this thing for me. Thank you so much. 30 seconds. Is, if you can find in the first 30 seconds, 30 second rule to encourage someone because encouragement is oxygen to the soul. You have no idea the person that you're talking to that might be on their last thread that might be this close to throwing in the towel and your encouragement might be just the thing that gets them over the hump, might be just the thing that causes them to not give up, to not quit. We live, by the way, I'm gonna say this. Our message is basically done. We live in a world where there's so many people that are going through discouragement and depression and despair if you, it, it just in the city of Frisco here, if you were to open a random house and look in, the, things look good on the outside, but when somebody's by themselves in their house, they are 
this close to throwing in the towel. And not only that, but we as believers, we are being attacked by the devil. Jesus was talking to his disciples that day in, in the upper room, and he was looking at them, love one another, love one another. Because when you leave this room, there's an enemy out there who's trying to take you under. There's an enemy out there who's trying to end you, who's trying to take your faith and just cast it to the wind and put it through the shredder. But if you will encourage one another, if you will have empathy with one another, if you will show hospitality and give to someone who needs, if you will give somebody what they need when they need it, that says, I love you. But we are in this world where we're just so vulnerable to attack and the devil hates God. And because he hates God, he hates God's children. And because he hates God's children, he's attacking us. He's attacking our homes. He's attacking our marriages. He's just trying to just throw us to the wind. But we can band together. We can love one another. We can grab one another. We can show affection to one another. We can encourage one another. And that is the thing that will make our world say, that's a real God. If they love one another. And by the way, not just love the way our world does. A supernatural love. A Holy Ghost love. A love that forgives when somebody doesn't deserve it. When somebody does something to me, I'm like, okay, it hurt. But God forgave me, so I forgive you. And this is true love being walked out. We must be loving one another in this way. I heard of a boy named Johnny. Johnny worked at a, a grocery store. He just got a brand new job at a grocery store. Something you need to know about Johnny. Johnny uh, had Down syndrome. And Johnny was uh, able to do some things and not able to do a lot of things. But he went to his dad. Johnny was in his early 20s. And he went to his dad and he said, Dad... I got this new job, I'm so happy, but what can I do? Can you help me? And Johnny sat down with his dad, and his dad helped him, and he said, I wanna, I wanna find some Bible verses, and I wanna encourage people. And so Johnny sat down with his dad, and he got about 10 different Bible verses, and they got on the computer, and they found, he put a Bible verse, and then he put like a word of encouragement with it. And Johnny was so excited. His dad helped him. He printed out a whole bunch of them. He chopped them up into a little piece of paper about the size of a fortune cookie. And Johnny took a lot of those with him, put them in his pocket, and went to his job. And he was a bagger at the grocery store. And people would come, and they would check out their groceries. And as they were leaving, Johnny would bag up their groceries, and he would get them ready, and he'd say, I bagged up your groceries, and then I put an encouragement inside of it. And that person would take their groceries, go in their car, and they'd Take that piece of paper in a Bible verse and a, and a word of encouragement. And people were like, wow, that, Johnny, thank you. And Johnny just started doing that. And he loved his job because he saw not just putting bags of groceries together, but he saw an opportunity to, to encourage people. And weeks went by. One day, one of the cashiers came to the manager's office and they said, you got to come quick. You got to come quick. And the manager said, what, what? And he went out and they saw that there was about four different registers that were open, but one of them had a huge group of people that were all gathered around it. And it was the one that Johnny was the bagger at. All these people were gathered around there. And those people had come to buy groceries from that grocery store on purpose and had come to check out at that checkout counter on purpose because they couldn't wait to receive that little note of encouragement with a Bible verse from Johnny. He had become a celebrity in his little corner of the world because encouragement says, I love you. And everybody likes to hear, I love you. There's not a person in here who doesn't like to be encouraged. There's not a person in here who doesn't like to be seen. There's not a person in here who doesn't like for somebody to feel with you what you're going through. So I want to encourage all of us. And after the service, I'm going to give out um, an envelope to everybody, to every head of household. And every, every head of household is going to get the name of somebody else in our church. And for the rest of this month, and as long as you want to, I would like for you to take that home and to think about, and I've got all these things listed as different ways that we can love one another. And to be creative. How can I love people in our church? How can I love people on my job? How can I love people in my neighborhood? How can I love people in my family? There's a lot of ways that we can love people. But they all are just that one commandment. Jesus said, I'm going to give you one commandment. 
love one another because we need to be loved. Love is a human need as a human because humans need love. They need affection. They need touch. They need attention. They need care. And not just babies, all of us. That's why God created families. He sets the solitary into families because a family is a place where you are loved, a place where you are seen, a place where you are encouraged. And so God put all of us into his family. He adopted us. He's our father. God gives us hugs. Did you know that? God gives hugs. The Holy Spirit will put his arms around you and hold you close. When you need God the most, he will be there for you. But sometimes the invisibility of God, he wants us to be that, the deliverer of that love to one another. Hey, God says he loves you. And I'm, I'm, his, I'm his hands and his feet today to show you that God loves you. All of us need love, but today I want to focus on how can we love one another. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, today I ask that you would open us in our imagination, open our creativity, open our eyes to see one another. Well, the devil's taking families out. He's taking, he's taking people down. He's taking husbands and wives and children, teenagers, people in their 20s, people in their 30s. He's coming after them. Lord, help us to be able to see what we can do to protect one another by building a wall of love that we can love one another. Lord, when we go out in this world, this world is a, is a hostile place. It's a cold place, a place where a lot of people are lonely. A lot of people are very discouraged. We can make a difference. But Lord, I pray but that before we see the world, we would see especially those that be of the household of faith. Because we're God's children. Lord, I pray that there would not be any of God's children in this place under the sound of my voice that do not know what it is to be loved by the body of Christ. Help us to feel each other's pain. Help us to see each other's needs and to be there. Help us to rush the aid as one member of the body that can feel Lord, I pray for somebody in this room that may not know the love of Christ because there's never been that day that they personally experienced the salvation and the forgiveness of Jesus. I pray that you would come very close to them and, and speak your love to their heart today. Lord, I pray if there's a believer who is away from you, that they would not feel the judgment of your body, but that they would feel the love of your body calling them close. Lord, I pray that we would practice love, that we'd get better at loving one another. Please give us your grace.